Welcome to the program. My name is Marty Schenkman, and we have what hopefully will be a really practical and interesting program for all of you today. We're going to talk about tangible personal property, a really critical topic that affects every single client um, and is too often not given the, uh, the respect it's due, I guess, the Rodney Dangerfield of planning. But when we're done today, hopefully you'll have a lot of practical and interesting information to help you deal with these issues. Uh, a couple of, of pointers. Um, the PowerPoint is on the web console. You can download it, click on the handout tab, and it'll be there for you to download. Uh, for any reason you don't find it, it's also on the Shankman Law uh, blog post on the Shankman Law website, and that link was in the email that you got in advance if you wanted to download it in advance. Uh, a recording of this program will be posted to the Shankman Law uh, website within a week, usually less. Uh, there's probably 60 at this point uh, full webinar recordings you can access at any time. And there's also a growing library of planning video clips on Law Easy, um, featuring a lot of the same people that you see on some of the webinars. We don't formally give CLE or CPE for the program, uh, but you will be sent a certificate of attendance. The last slide is for a company that does provide CLE, and you can watch this program on there. Uh, website to get um, uh, credits. If you have questions, instead of entering them on the panel, uh, all of the panelists have been gracious enough to give me email addresses. All the email addresses are at the end uh, slide, so you can access that. Just email any of the panelists and we'll all be happy to try to answer questions after the program. Um, and before we begin, just a, a couple of other real quick comments. The format that I'm going to use, that we're going to use for the program today, is uh, going to be a little different, and I, I think it's going to be really great because we have some really incredibly smart people. Um, I'm going to let each person, when they um, uh, in, introduce themselves, but uh, Roberta uh, is got auction house background, which is different. Sandy, and I'm going to again in a second let everyone introduce themselves after our, our um, um, sponsors uh, speak briefly. Sandy is an estate planner but has extensive litigation background. Kim is an estate planner but works in a wealth management firm. So we're going to get a lot of very interesting different perspectives on planning for tangible property. And what I've done is I've asked each of the panelists not to be shy and if they have a, a, a good idea to feel free to jump in and share it. So there'll be a few points where we're perhaps stepping on each other's toes uh, as we talk, but I think it'll make it for a more dynamic program and it'll assure that if there's some creative ideas that they all get shared. And again, I'm gonna have each speaker introduce themselves in a second. First, a, a quick word from our two sponsors, Vanessa. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thanks Marty and thanks everyone for attending um, and welcome. Uh, as Marty said, um, I'm Vanessa Kanega. I'm uh, the CEO of Interactive Legal and um, appreciate you all attending today's webinar and appreciate Marty for sponsoring it and of course the panelists for being on. Um, this is a great topic as usual for a, a Shankman webinar and we're also focused on the pending tax law changes these days that it's great to get something a little bit more practical and get right to the root of why people engage in estate planning. So appreciate all of our panelists for presenting today. Um, for more information on Interactive Legal, please feel free to email sales, the sales email address you see on your screen, or visit our website at interactivelegal.com. You'll also find um, a library of these webinars, uh, Shankman webinars, as well as our Interactive Legal webinars on there as well for your viewing. Thanks very much. And by the way, thank you to Interactive. We've reproduced at the end of the slide deck um, a sample uh, tangible property provision uh, that Interactive has provided. And there's also some very good sample provision that Sandy uh, has provided as well. So at the end of the PowerPoint, and we won't get that far, and I don't think we're going to go through the sample provisions, we've given all of you a number of sample clauses you can use. Nicole? Hi. Hey, excuse me. Welcome, everyone, and thank you uh, for attending today's webinar. Uh, my name is Nicole King. I'm a trust officer here at Peak Trust Company, and we are pleased and honored to be able to sponsor today's uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to tell you about Peak Trust. We serve individuals, families, and their advisors by offering a tax-favored trust situs in either Alaska or Nevada, we are a full service trust company and we offer flexible and customized uh, administrative services for all types of trusts. If you should have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to contact myself 
um, or any member of our team, um, you can find our information on the materials um, and uh, also on our website. So with that, I turn it back over to you, Marty. Thank you, Nicole. Um, my custom has been that for every webinar we do, and we don't charge for the webinars, uh, we just try to give out as much good free information as we can to feature uh, a different charity each time. And if any of you listening have a favorite charity that we haven't featured, please contact me and I'll be happy to do so. Um, so for this uh, program, we're going to hear from Lisa Lager from Wild Cornell. Lisa? Thank you, Marty. Uh, I'm the Director of Planning Giving at Wild Cornell, and thanks for inviting us today. It's been over a year since the first case of COVID-19 was reported in New York City, and since then, the pandemic has led, had an overwhelming impact on our lives. Throughout it all, Wild Cornell Medicine has continually evolved to meet new and ongoing health challenges by strengthening and expanding its ability to care, discover, and teach. Philanthropic support uh, it can help with a variety of initiatives across all pillars of our mission, including clinical care, research, education, capital and equipment needs, and efforts to recruit and retain outstanding physicians. If you or your clients are interested in maximizing philanthropic planning to make a lasting impact to save lives, please contact me. My information is listed on the slide. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lisa. And now before we jump in, uh, as I said to you in the beginning, we really have some incredible people I'm honored and thrilled to be able to speak with. Sandy, why don't you just give a, a quick uh, background and mention your firm and uh, whatever else you want to say. Thanks, Marty. Um, I'm a equity shareholder with the firm of Lipson Nielsen, and we are located in our, our principal offices in Michigan, but we also have offices in Las Vegas, Nevada, in uh, Colorado and in Arizona. Um, and our, our Nevada office, Nicole, is a pretty large office as well. So uh, we uh, are a full service law firm and it, in our office, I do a lot of not only the planning um, and advising administrators, but also litigation, as Marty had indicated. So um i think this is a really important topic because it tends to be the topic that a lot of people end up fighting over even if the estate is not large uh, so i'm pleased to be able to assist our viewers in understanding uh, some of the issues that they may be able to think about when planning that could avoid litigation in the future and that litigation perspective is incredibly important i've seen probably uglier fights over tangible property than almost anything in my 36 years of practicing. Um, Kim Kamen is, is brilliant, and I've had the honor and pleasure of speaking with her many times, often the uh, Trust and Estate Program at uh, Notre Dame. Uh, Kim has uh, uh, not only a great legal background, but works in the financial world as well, so she too brings uh, multiple perspectives. Kim, why don't you just introduce yourself and mention your firm? Oh, sure, thank you so much, Marty. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, as Marty said, I'm Kim Kamen. I'm a principal and the chief wealth strategist at Gresham Partners, which is a wealth management firm um, that serves as a multifamily office to over 100 families across the country. And in my role as chief wealth strategist there, we do work with families on all kinds of topics uh, relating to estate planning and fiduciary administration. And certainly um, a big one is talking to people about what they wanna have happen with their tangible personal property and making sure that doesn't get lost in the financial planning. So uh, this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart and it's a pleasure to be here, thank you. And finally, Roberta Kramer is with one of the premier auction houses in the country, so she will present comments on yet a different perspective, which I, I think is great. Roberta, why don't you tell everyone who Heritage is, just in case there's one person out there that has not heard of Heritage. Thanks, Marty. I'm very happy to be here. I, of course, spend all of my time dealing with tangible personal property and the fights, etc. So it's very nice to be able to join all of you who are in the planning phase and try to help out with some practical advice. Heritage Auctions is the, um, well, as they rate them, we're the third largest auction house in the world. We are also the only American company. We were founded in the 70s. Our cor corporate global headquarters is in Dallas, Texas. 
However, we have offices in New York, San Francisco. I am managing director of our Chicago and Midwest office, as well as offices overseas. And we deal with a huge broad range of personal property and some things that I would venture almost nobody else does, including a new department for video games and Pokemon cards that are bringing huge money, not exactly the asset classes most planners would ask about. So are you suggesting I should not have thrown out my kids' old Pokemons? Yes, I'm afraid so. It's I did the same thing, don't feel bad. <laughs> so really a, a critical starting point is what is tangible property? And I must give credit to uh, Jerry Hesch, who many of you may know, he's a professor at University of Miami and, and runs the Notre Dame Institute, that uh, amazing looking motorcycle and convertible are Jerry's. And he uh, graciously let us use uh, his, 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 uh, his tangibles to illustrate what tangibles are. Um, Kim, do you wanna uh, give an introduction to tangibles and uh, kick it off? <coughs> Absolutely, uh, and we have a cheat sheet at the, at, we have a little uh, tagline at the bottom of the slide that helps, but for those of you who didn't go to law school or who haven't really thought about it, um, all assets are classified into two categories. They're either real property or they're personal property. Then personal property is further divided into tangible personal property or intangible personal property, like securities, intellectual property, digital assets. So when we're talking about tangible property, as the slide says, it's everything that is not real property or intangible personal property. So uh, oftentimes uh, people don't even realize the full extent of what the tangible property is, but uh, it, it includes cash, it includes the decedent's wallet, it includes uh, the clothes that are in their closet their jewelry, their dishes, their silver, their furnishings, as, as Marty pointed out uh, in the slide, the, the vehicles that they have, um, and of course their pets as well. So tangible property is a, really a very broad category and anything that is not real property or intangible personal property. And Kim, um, you know, last year in 2020, Florida even went so far as to clarify in case you just, it w if it wasn't clear to you before, Florida wanted everyone to understand that precious metals, even if it's currency, but it's not used as currency, would be considered to be disposed of under a tangible personal property disposition provision. So understanding the scope of what could be covered by our general provisions I give all my tangible property to uh, is an important starting point for any estate plan. Yep, that's that's exactly right. And as you see on this slide, you know, tangible property does include some things that might not readily come to mind, but might be of great value. Um, the client's art, uh, gold bars or coins that they have hidden somewhere, or their wine collection that could be very valuable, uh, uh, boats, um, their gun collection, horses and other livestock that, that they may have at the family farm. There are so many things that, that we need to consider when it comes to our clients' tangible property. And, and these also point out some of the, just a, the beginning of the many, many issues we're going to talk about. So a gun collection can not only be incredibly valuable, but it raises a host of legal issues in terms of transferability, how it's transferred, to whom it's transferred, and so on. Uh, horses, and we're going to get into this later, if they're part of a uh, entity that owns the farm, you know, how, how is that going to be addressed? And we're going to cover all these issues in, in some more depth. But, but I think the key take-home point is that tangible property is incredibly broad in terms of, of the assets that it can um, include. They have incredible emotional um, uh, considerations that affect tangible property for many of our clients and, and, and regardless of wealth levels. And for some clients, often surprising and even unbeknownst to some of the clients themselves, incredible value. So I, I think that the key take home point is that we all need to be more deliberate in trying to get clients to discuss what they want done with tangible property than sometimes happens. And, and being deliberate with that will help us avoid some of the issues and pitfalls that we're gonna talk about. Um, Sandy, do you wanna uh, 
comment on, on some of the uh, issues on our next slide. All right. Sure, Marty. Um, you've kind of alluded to, when you talked about the horses, the titling issue, right? So it's really important to understand who owns the property. Is it owned by the trust? Is it owned by the individuals individually or jointly? Does it belong to an entity that one of the parties has an interest in, such as an LLC? Or um, is it uh, who ends up owning that property is going to have a significant impact on the dispositive provisions? Because if you say, I give all of my tangible personal property to my children, but the artwork is held in the LLC, that provision won't control the disposition of that artwork. So titling becomes very important. Um, and it's also between individuals, it's hard to tell sometimes who owns the property because not every item like the Pokemon cards that Roberta alerted, alluded to earlier. Who owns that? Is that still the child's Pokemon card? Or does that belong to the parent who purchased the Pokemon card and retained control over it because the kids moved out of the house and didn't take it with them? So who owns that item is important as part of the planning process because it will control disposition ultimately. Also, a lot of people don't realize that items they have may include protected material, and that can impact who you can leave it to, how it can be transported, it can impact the value, and as Kim is going to talk about in the future, provenance can be really important when dealing with protected material. And then I say this is the trump card when dealing with estate planning issues related to personal property. And that's the emotional attachments that people have to the things they've collected during their lifetime or that their parents or loved ones have collected during their lifetime. And so this may be the last playground for people to fight about who mom or dad loved more or how somebody slighted them during, when they were growing up. It's, it was related to the emotional aspects of the tangible personal property that people end up having. Yeah, just and, and it all, oh, go ahead, well, Roberta. I was just gonna say that um, what Sandy just said is so right, you know, as an appraiser who does the, who comes to the estate and is often with the family, the children, the grandchildren, walking around and they're telling you stories about, you know, mom loved this, et cetera. The um, mommy loved me best quotient, the emotional factor and the fights over the personal property. It's rarely about the value in my 30 something years of experience. It's there's, a, I mean, I would have been better off becoming a psychologist <laughs> in some ways. Uh, at one point we had one estate uh, outside of Chicago that got so contentious, three daughters, they each had, were litigating each, against each other. They all had retained separate counsel. And one night I, I just had this crazy idea and I called um, the estate planner and I said, hey, let's have an auction just for the three of them. I sat in their mother's dining room. I conducted an auction only for the three daughters. Their spouses couldn't be there. And in the end, it turns out the items that were hotly bid over and fought over, it was the cookie jar. It was worth $10. There were things that were, were worth tens of thousands of dollars. It's about the emotional attachment to these things. And it's a hard conversation to start. Thank you. And that's the perfect segue to the additional point I wanted to make, which is that some of these items are absolutely not of value to anyone else, but because tangible property includes um, the parents' journals, their photographs, 
um, any letters that they had written or kept and cards that that can also be something that's very fraught as multiple family members want to have these original memories and certainly one solution is to make copies now thankfully uh, due to technology there's a lot of opportunities to scan and share these items which hopefully reduces some of the conflicts that might have existed in the past uh, but there still are the original letters, you know, that mom and dad wrote each other during their courtship and whatnot, so. Well, and it, it becomes even more complex, Kim, when we add in the blended family scenario, right? So that simple bequest to, I leave all my tangible personal property to my surviving spouse. And that surviving spouse is not the parent of your children. And so all of those items that have that emotional value to the children may not have the same level of attachment to that surviving spouse, but it may well be the way or the wedge that that surviving spouse can use when the children are not respectful to the surviving spouse or they don't have a good relationship with that surviving spouse who is not their parent. And so when we come to dealing with blended families, recognizing these issues on the front end can help our clients to plan for mechanism to put into place to address those kinds of issues, especially if we've got planning. For those of you who are estate planners, you might be leaving your estate in a Q-tip trust for a surviving spouse. And so one of the aspects of a Q-tip trust is making sure that the items are income producing. So the spouse who has no attachment may be very happy to get rid of those, uh, those little figurines you see on the screen that mean so much to the family, but the surviving spouse just views as clutter. And so they would much rather have Roberta sell those off and turn them into income that they can live on, thinking about things like rights of first refusal or other mechanisms for dealing with those items, either not including them in the bequest to the surviving spouse or giving rights of first refusal can be really important. The ugliest battle that I've seen in 36 years of practice was over a candelabra that um, the first, the mother, the, fir the mother, the first wife of, of, of the gentleman involved uh, used for religious purposes. And her daughters wanted the candelabra, we were apparently promised the candelabra, and the husband's will, when he later died, after the mother had died, years later, left exactly as Sandy just described, everything to the sur his surviving wife, second wife, not the mother of the children. And that candelabra became an absolute battle cry between the daughter from the, 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 the first marriage, whose mother lit it for all the years of her life, most of the years of her life, and, and, and the second wife. And it was, it was tragic. Had somebody merely discussed the issue and addressed it in some manner, almost any manner, it could have all been avoided. So, so these issues are, are really significant. And um, do any of you have any thoughts on why these issues don't get discussed enough? Because that certainly seems to be one of the problems. Uh, Marty, I think that um, some estate planners may feel because most states have the ability to utilize a list disposition, that the client can go back and they can address those kinds of issues by simply filling out the list and dealing with them and that they don't want to spend the, uh, the time because a lot of clients have sticker shock when they meet with us and they say, how much is it going to cost for you to help me devise or document my plan? And they want to spend as little as possible. Well, the less time we spend with them, the less opportunity we have to delve into issues or when you send them out a questionnaire right or an asset disclosure sheet they may not actually list these types of issues down on those sheets 
And it's only through a discussion that you can peel away at the onion and get to the root of some of the issues that might exist. So I think these aren't intentionally overlooked. I think that a lot of people just don't realize how important these issues can ultimately become when it comes to uh, the resolution of their state. I, I, I'll take a perfect example. Kim and I were talking about this last month, I think it was, the Audrey Hepburn estate, right? So the issues in that estate that remained subject to litigation for over a decade related to her tangible property located in a storage locker. So these are the kinds of issues that come up, but I think people feel I'm treating my children equally. I'm dividing the assets between them equally. They'll be able to come to a resolution, not realizing that some of these issues just will become uh, the boiling point in the relationship between surviving individuals. Well, and Sandy, I think that I hear this a lot from older clients when I'm assisting with a downsize. And when I bring it up, obviously suggesting that they speak with their estate planner about my children's grandchildren, fill in the blank, they all get along beautifully. We would mm -hmm. never have a problem like that in our family. And then I have a lot of clients when I ask, well, what's your legacy plan for your collection? I mean, these are people who are collectors as opposed to people who just have tangible personal property. We all have tangible personal property, but some people have spent a great deal of time and energy and perhaps money amassing an actual collection that's focused and with purpose, et cetera. And a lot of people, bottom line, people don't like to think about dying. Yeah. And so it's, it's not something that they're not going to come to you and go, you know, and maybe if they get sick or maybe now with this whole last horrible year we've all lived through, it's put it in the front of people's minds. But I have many a client in their 70s who said, I just don't like to think about that. My children will deal with it. There, there's to, to summarize, I think Sandy pointed out concern over legal fees, absolutely for real. Roberta pointed out that people think their, their heirs get along, which too often is not the case. And often the more they think they're going to get along, the less they do get along. And, and um, nobody wants to talk about dying. There's another factor that uh, could become a, a more significant factor, and that is taxes. So when we had a million dollar or 600,000, for those of you that have been around as long as I, a $600,000 exemption, a lot of people that had uh, any kind of valuable tangibles uh, didn't really want to address them with counsel under the, the theory that, gee, if, you know, when, if we don't talk about it, somehow the IRS isn't going to know about it, which obviously in, in many cases it w was not the case. And if the exemption is reduced now from the 11.7 down to 3.5, which is what the Sanders proposal that was just uh, put forth recently uh, does, if the exemptions are reduced significantly, we could really find, uh, again, more issues of people trying to not address tangibles with, with their advisors because they feel somehow it's going to be off radar for the IRS. And, and those factors that we've just gone through lead to many of these problems. So I think it's incumbent upon us as advisors to try to address these factors head on and see if we can't encourage clients to be able to address these things uh, uh, more significantly. Uh, Sandy, do you want to take charge on slide 11? Sure. Um, well, Marty, you kind of raised the issue on the religious items. Uh, and Roberta, you mentioned personal collections, and I think dealing with collections is really important because a collection as a whole may have more value than its individual component parts. And so addressing that in the planning process when we're talking about maybe the process that we've included is a round robin where people get to select an item and the next air selects the next item. Well, does that deal with a collection as each item, each individual part of that item, or the collection as a whole? And then how do you deal with equalization? 
if there are certain items that are really more valuable as a collection, but other items can't true up to that value, right? So thinking about those kinds of things can be really important. When we t And I raise the issue of a list disposition, but thinking about when are the items on that list supposed to become operative? Will it become operative on the first spouse's death? Or will it become operative only after the second spouse has died? And addressing how you can deal with that, are you really providing for a life estate in those tangible personal property items? Or are you intending those items go outright at the death of the first spouse? So dealing with those kinds of issues can be really important and making sure you've coordinated your plans, right? You don't dispose of one item one way and deal with it a different way in another document because um, that's going to lead to more arguments over what's going to happen. And as Kim has indicated, you know, we live in a different world today. We can scan, we can make reproductions, we can get uh, the photographs divided between the family, but there are items that we simply can't cut up and divide between the family members. So figuring out how to address those items in an equitable fashion, in a way that um, fulfills what the grantor settler intends uh, can be very touch, it can be a very touchy subject, right? So uh, sometimes it's something we may deal with. Sometimes it's something you may deal with, Roberta, when going through the items with individuals because sometimes they're getting rid of things during their lifetime and not waiting till death to dispose of these items. That's yeah. right. And, and Sandy, there's a step in between that, which is that, you know, as, as all of you have mentioned, you know, sometimes clients don't want to talk to this to their attorneys about this and be charging by the hour because this really can be a very time consuming process. They don't want to think about their mortality, so it's depressing to think about them not having these things anymore or their family members not caring about them as much. Um, but it really is quite a time undertaking and you need to have somebody who can hold your hand through that process. So, you know, for some families, they they may be working with financial advisors who are only interested in the financial assets that they're getting paid to manage. But for families who are fortunate enough to be working um, with consultants or with a multifamily office um, or have a, their own single family office with individuals who really can devote the time and care to hold their hands through that process, which oftentimes can be a multi-year process with a lot of changes throughout it. You know, these, these things evolve, they get rid of things, they, but to have family meetings and bring the, the children into these discussions about who wants what earlier rather than later and try to have that happen while everyone is, uh, is on good terms and, and healthy is, is absolutely the time to do it for families who are fortunate enough to uh, have advisors who'll help. Well, and for I think families that have less means, if you it, it, then would have the advice of a family office, etc. We often see that you know, very nice home, very nice things in general. There's one very valuable painting, and it was passed through uh, the family over a period of a hundred years or more. And people will say to me, well, I'm leaving it to my grandchildren. Fractional ownership of a, something like a single valuable painting is a disaster. It's a disaster for the family. It's a disaster for the painting. So as planners, even if you're not dealing with a, an estate that could be in a taxable position, at least for the next couple of years here, I, you need to ask because these, it will devalue the painting, it will cause a fight, you can't break it up. It's easier to divide money than it is to divide things. I, I think there's a, the, the, there's a point that's been mentioned a couple of times that I think is, is just not addressed enough that relates back to that, and that's the idea of downsizing. Many of our clients stay in their homes because they're comfortable, they know them, they feel secure there, and their homes as they age, you know, with stairs, uh, lawns they keep mowing. I have a client who's 96 and keeps mowing his lawn and shoveling his snow himself. 
And every time I talk to him, I, I beg him to sell the home and move someplace to a condo or an apartment, something where he doesn't have to deal with those risks. But part of that downsizing discussion is what happens with the stuff. And it really doesn't have to be a costly or involved discussion. You can, you can hire a company, there's online uh, resources as well, um, where you can take all the old family photographs, all the old uh, uh, eight millimeter videos uh, that, that were shot, and they can put everything on a single hard drive and you can upload it into Dropbox or any cloud-based portal and give access to everyone. So proactively, we can help as part of the downsizing discussion that many clients should have and avoid um, getting some of these things addressed. And, and, and it's, not, it's not only about cost or value. I mean, to have all the family photographs, I, a personal story, when my, my parents died, somehow one of my nephews ended up with all the old family videos. I have no idea how he ended up with them. I guess he was uh, in Detroit one day and my father gave him like a trunk load of videos. He had no idea what to do with them. And one day called me, I, I got them all and went someplace, got them all digitized and uploaded them on Dropbox and sent everyone the link and there they, they stay for everyone to access whenever they want. So I think that there are a lot of practical things that we as advisors can do, but we have to start having the discussion, not only in context of estate planning, but you can spin it, you know, and, and I think it was Roberta who mentioned clients don't like, which we all know, to think about death, but hey, you know, for the next next phase of your life, when you downsize and simplify your life to make it safer and easier, what about all the photographs? What about all the videos? What about the collectibles? What can we do with them? Uh, the, the comment that Roberta made, I've seen happen scores of times, and I'm sure everyone on this call has seen it, where there's one or two very valuable items and what's gonna happen with them. Putting it off or, or kind of dismissing it, like saying, gee, my grandkids will have it, is not an answer. But we can, we can engage in those discussions, and if we reframe the discussion from planning about dying to planning about um, uh, you know the next phase of your life and making it easier, I think we'll find some clients, will, many clients, will be more receptive. And soon, if, if if the exemptions come down, for an awful lot of clients now that are ignoring the tax aspects of these issues, those will become real again, and that may too motivate clients uh, to start to plan uh, a little more so than they have been uh, now. Um, Kim, Marty, if I could, before, sure. you, before you go to testamentary plan structure, on the heirlooms, uh, and I'm sure Roberta could probably jump in on this, oftentimes those are the items either that have an emotional attachment or and people don't realize what the value of some of those items are. So some of those items could be very valuable or people assume they're valuable and they really have no real value at all other than the emotional value that's attached to them. So really having a better understanding of what those heirlooms entail and whether the value that is attached to them is monetary, emotional, or both can also help as part of the estate plan. That's right, Sandy. And more often than not now, we find in dealing with uh, older clients who are moving, downsizing, going to Florida, what have you, it, more often than not, we are encountering the, it's not valuable anymore. Markets have changed so dramatically that at one time it was valuable. And then further as advisors, if you look at, you know, people will stick an insurance schedule in front of me and I'll be like, oh my God, these values were from 30 years ago. You've been paying a premium. Your clients have been paying premium on a house full of brown furniture and English porcelain that is almost impossible to sell anymore. There's no market anymore. So you you find that more, but you also of course do find the opposite, like you know, the the bowl that the dog's leash is in and people's keys in the front hall. And you're like, oh my God, it's a Chinese porcelain bowl. It's Ming and it's worth a half a million dollars. And you have the dog's leash in it. So there's no question about it. Very, very few people that I encounter from day to day are aware of what the current value is on these types of heirlooms. One of the things that I recommend to clients, and not nearly enough have, have followed through, uh, is to hire a firm to come in and do an inventory and valuation of the collectibles. 
And the result of that process is that you get a photographic, electronic photographic journal with provenance, and we're gonna talk about that, and description of everything, and a value. So you can update the insurance so it has some reasonable relationship to what real values are. And if clients wanna decide how to allocate to heirs, children or otherwise, those items, they have a, a, a photographic journal that they can simply append a name to or write a list from based on a full accountability of everything and realistic values. So it's it's not only great for, for doing the dispositions that we've been talking about, it's really critical, and I thought Roberta's point was, was spot on, how to make sure that you, you insure things properly. You don't want to find something that was not even listed, you know, is worth $100,000 and it's not properly insured. And how do you prove to an insurance company if there's a flood, a fire, what you even had without an electronic compilation? I mean, one of the things in the old days that, that you know, I even did personally, I still do occasionally, is I'll run around the whole house and take photographs of everything. And, and in the old days, I used to put the, uh, the, the negatives or copies of the photos in a safe deposit box. Now they're backed up online to a cloud portal in case uh, everything burns down. Uh, a lot of clients just never do that. I mean, they can start with the photographs and get them backed up to uh, wherever they're hopefully backing up their, their laptop to and uh, graduate to having a, a professional firm come in. And the cost is surprisingly reasonable and the comfort of having a, a, a handle on what you actually own is, is, is wonderful. And that's something that should be really a recommendation we make to lots and lots of clients. Um, Kim, do you want to talk about testamentary structure and then we'll all kind of chime in? Absolutely. So, so sure. So once we have uh, made sure that our clients have an inventory of all of their items and valuation for that, and uh, certainly sheltering at home this past year has been a great time. Some clients have taken those kinds of projects on themselves, organizing, uh, organizing everything and inventorying it, um, but and then trying to get some sense of where where the emotional hot points will be uh, based on the. Uh, um, you know, history of the items and the family's emotional connections to them, then the next item of importance is to figure out, well, how should the, the plan be designed? Um, and uh, if you'll turn to the next slide, Marty, um, as you had alluded to, you know, sometimes clients have this idea, well, you know, it's not that valuable and it's, it, it's not really, you know, and no one's going to ever take note of this. Um, and, and they have this idea that all the valuables are just going to vanish when they die. Um, and by the way, unfortunately, sometimes some of that does happen. My mother always told me that jewelry has feet after my grandmother's jewelry was in a shoebox hiding in her closet while she was taking law school exams and vanished after there were some workmen in the house. Um, but so sometimes things do just vanish. Um, and sometimes family members may help themselves to things that they see or people who are working in the home. Um, you know, but for the most part, when, when anyone has in mind that, uh, that items will just disappear, we call this the empty hook syndrome. This is something that was coined by Michael Mendelssohn um, in his book, Life is Short, Art is Long. Um, but there are absolutely a number of problems with that thinking. Um, you know, it's pretty obvious if there is a family of, of some wealth and they are going to be filing an estate tax return when, uh, when uh, the appraiser comes to the home to do the inventory and just finds shadows on the wall with hooks where uh, the uh, valuable artwork should have been um, or where there's a very valuable estate and someone's trying to report that the value of the, the property was nominal, um, just it's, it's difficult for the for the auditors to believe that. <laughs> um, but the other, the other thing I always do point out is that it's not very kind of clients who are asking individuals or even worse, you know, banks or corporate fiduciaries to be put in a position where they don't have full information and may actually, um, uh, as I say, uh, the F word, right? You do not want to ask the fiduciaries to be engaging in tax fraud. It's a, it's a very uh, unkind uh, position to put them in. <laughs> um, but there's also issues with actually capturing what that value is for and figuring Figuring out what the provenance of these items are, if anyone ever is going to try to sell them, 
um, you need those records to establish what was the basis in the in the items. You know, even um, relatively recently, I was looking back at my grandfather's estate tax return with my parents, trying to figure out what is the basis of certain items that they have in their home. Um, so these can be really important um, ways to make sure that that clients can defend the the basis of the property that they inherited if they eventually sell it and also its provenance where did it come from and 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 where what are the records for it um, Marty I think you actually had a funny story about someone who tried to avoid the empty hook syndrome in their own way um, yeah I had uh, a client many 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 years ago is it, it, it was decades ago and it was one of my early estate planning clients when I first started in the profession and um, she had went out and had purchased um, posters, for lack of a better term, really you know junky stuff, and had them all custom framed. And she had them custom framed to be the exact size of the very, very expensive artwork she had on the wall. And uh, one day when I met with her in her apartment in New York City, what she said to me was, uh, when she hung the closet, my, my coat up in the closet, I saw all these things in the closet. I said, why do you keep you know, artwork in the closet? And she kind of chuckled. And she explained that she had these pieces framed, custom framed to be the same size of the expensive artwork on her wall. And if anything happens to her, her daughter was instructed to come into the house and um, take the expensive artwork and hang the, uh, the cheap, framed artwork that would avoid the uh, shadows on the wall that Kim talked about all on the hooks and avoid the empty hooks. So she took it really to the nth degree. Certainly not something they I wanted to be part of, to but uh, it shows you how far people go. I've yeah, seen them get I'll go. the uh, boxes I, and, and more than one occasion. D where's the jewelry? Did your mother have jewelry? We're there with the fiduciaries doing the federal estate tax appraisal. Mother didn't have any jewelry, Roberta. I'm like, our mother collected empty Harry Winston boxes? <laughs> <laughs> At least take the boxes, people. I mean, it's it's very, we see it all the time. We see that hanging up a different picture. And it, I, your client sounds like she made them just the right size. They're often not. <laughs> Well, but also, you know, if, if the IRS is not foolish either, and they know to go back and look at the insurance and the scheduled property, I mean, that's not a mystery. And frankly, that that's very common on an audit. So, you know, it, it's it's one thing to plan, but a, a lot of clients, and we we as advisors have to be careful. We don't want to get caught up in that. Yeah. Oh, and then you right. get the one, one child who says, you know what? Mom really had X, Y, and Z, and you guys didn't split it equally with me, and it all ends up coming out. And yep. then, right now, they're imputing that there was actually more there than had been there. So you could be in a worse position as a result of it. Yeah, ab yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so yeah, number number one point there is uh, we're all uh, able to uh, influence our clients and, and remind them what the rules are and, and what the right thing to do is. Um, but in addition to that, you know, we also are in an opportunity to help them think about how to actually structure the plan. So making sure that there's a complete inventory and that they've thought about who should be getting what and hopefully had open communications about that. Um, but also that they are avoiding probate to the extent that tangible property is not assigned to a revocable trust. And many practitioners do blanket assignments and think about making sure that the that the tangible property is in a trust or in an LLC as, as there have been some references to. Um, but absolutely making sure that those items avoid probate at least keeps those fights and, and the inventories and the discussions about the tangible property out of the probate course discussion. Um, and then to have, oh, go ahead, Marty. Yeah, let's just comment on what Kim said because I think there's some very important points there. What it, and, and it may be obvious, so I apologize, but just in case it's not obvious to somebody on, in the audience, I wanna make sure it's clear. When Kim is mentioning a blanket assignment, that's like a standard boilerplate. I hereby assign all tangible property that I own to the Marty Shankman Revocable Trust dated such and such. 
I prefer where the clients will do it to actually list property that's being assigned. And, and I'll give you a couple of, of examples. First of all, if, if we have a specific list of property that's being assigned, we actually know what's being done and what's not being done. And I think we're gonna talk later about after acquired property, because if you assign what you own today and you buy something tomorrow, is that in the trust or not in the trust, you could probably do a blanket that would capture that. But uh, it's not a bad idea, especially if somebody has valuable collectibles to keep, keep, a, um, keep it specific so you know what's really being done and what's not being done. And that can correlate back with the dispositive scheme, the list that they keep and so on and so forth. I also find that important in second, third, fourth, fifth marriages. I don't know that I've gotten beyond fifth because if some property is deemed separate property, other is not, you can be very careful which trust you assign it to. We've had clients create separate property revocable trust to make sure that it's sort of a, uh, an envelope to differentiate premarital separate property. And they may have a separate trust that is for marital property. And you got to be careful. You can't have a blanket assignment uh, without running into issues when you have multiple things going on like that. Kim? So Mar Marty, if I could, I think I, I would take a different approach. Um, I like using the blanket assignment. Uh, the, the issues that you've raised are important ones, especially if you're doing a joint trust or if you're in a community property state. If you're in a community property state or you're using a joint trust, then clearly you want to be very specific as to what each person has contributed to the trust because um, it may or may not be revocable on the first spouse's death. You want to make sure people know what they can still access and what they can't. Um, there are considerations when you're dealing with a joint trust, whether it be community property or a non-community property state. The other issue is even if you've got specific assignments into a trust or general assignment into a trust, when you have a right that's retained by the grantor to dispose of property, however he or she may desire or direct the trustee during their lifetime, then assets can flow out of the trust very easily as well. So the fact that it was titled to the trust or assigned to the trust doesn't mean that it wasn't assigned elsewhere after that assignment took place. So... You know, I think those issues as to where does the asset belong just keep coming up no matter how you devise your assignment. This is all going to change potentially too if, for example, the Sanders tax proposal or something akin to it is enacted. If we end up with a GST tax assessed every 50 years on a trust, the, the idea of passing tangibles into a dynastic trust to keep in the family line forever uh, could be, will have to be reevaluated because how are you going to pay a tax on uh, an, an, a tangible asset? Um, where are you going to have the liquidity? And if a tax is due every 50 years, which may be one of the things that's, that's uh, enacted, um, that, that could really be significant. Another thing is to avoid the implications of this GST treatment every 50 years, which is talked about in the Sanders tax proposal. Uh, and this is just something I'm toying with. I haven't really thought it through. We may find that we're starting to use uh, uh, entities, partnerships, FLPs, family limited partners, LLCs, uh, in lieu of trust to avoid that 50 year rule. Uh, and if that happens, we're going to have a lot of different dynamics with how we structure the, 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 um, the uh, trusts or entities, the vehicles that own tangible property. So this, this could be very fluid and we could see a lot of different things coming up depending on what, what ultimately gets enacted, if anything, I guess, because it, it remains so uncertain. And Marty, if you leave tangible personal property in trust, the issue of use becomes of some import. Because uh, let's say it's a Queen Anne chair that's in the trust, right? That's sitting in somebody's home. And do they, they use it? it uh, the trust is insuring it. What happens if a leg breaks off? What happens if the puppy chews the leg of the Queen Anne chair while it was in that beneficiary's control? 
you know, so life estates and tangible personal property, especially if it's not art hanging up on the wall, right, can also have its own set of issues when it comes to what ends up, you know, who's responsible if something ends up happening to that tangible personal property. And as far as fiduciaries go, some fiduciaries don't want to have to be in control of or responsible for tangible personal property. So when you're talking about the structure of your plan and you're dealing with tangible personal property, you need to think about will the fiduciary that you've nominated be willing to act to control and administer that tangible personal property? Or do you need a directed trust or some other um, arrangement to deal with the tangible personal property? And perhaps you want to talk to those fiduciaries ahead of time to see what their policy will be. Will they take all the jewelry? Will they take the Harry Winston jewelry and say, because it's so valuable, we have to keep it in our safety deposit box for the duration of the trust? So that no family really gets the benefit of enjoyment of that item of tangible personal property. It's a very, very important point, and I'm seeing more and more trust done with institutional trustees and institutions logically, for the reasons you just said, are concerned with the liability exposure for holding tangibles. So what we've done is structured directed trusts where we have an art trustee, for example, appointed. And sometimes it's not an art trustee, but a committee of multiple people, three, four people, uh, that will make decisions concerning artwork that's held by the trust so that we can have situs in a trust-friendly jurisdiction, but avoid the, the concerns that you just raised uh, that many institutions have. And then you have to deal with the functioning of that art trustee committee and how they function how they decide who can use what, when, where, and so on. So a lot, lot of issues to address. Um, Sandy, I, I think we should go on to the next page, and I believe you are going to continue commenting. In terms of um, when we talk about the assets that we've, we've already talked about inventory and safeguarding them, um, we've addressed some of the methodologies for valuing these items. Uh, in terms of mechanisms for division, you know, there are probably as many mechanisms for division as there are ideas in our head, right? You know, round robin, uh, there's a program, there's a com program, fair, fair value, uh, people bid with, uh, emotional dollars on items that they want to acquire. There are a lot of different ways we can deal with these things, but thinking about whether you want to equalize the value or the number of items, how you're going to true up value if you want an equalization, how you're going to resolve disputes dealing with the tangible personal property. And also in terms of structuring your plan, apportioning the tax related to those tan items of tangible personal property can be really important because if you just say pay the tax all my tax from the residue but that one artwork that roberta referred to that's the only item of value goes to one child and all the other children get items that no in in totality can't approach the value of that one item of art, then they're getting the double whammy if they also have to pay the tax out of their share for that one piece of art they didn't get. So thinking about how you're going to approach all of those issues when you're dealing with tangible personal property can be really important. Who's going to bear the risk of the taxes? Who's going to Who's going to bear the risk of storage and insuring and dealing and transporting? All those kinds of issues are items you have to think about when you're thinking about um, tangible personal property. And I think I already raised the issue of life estate and that, what that can cause, as well as 
rights of first refusal, especially when you have a use of front interest. You know, you've left it to the surviving spouse. The fiduciary has to liquidate because the spouse wants to get rid of it and they want to convert it into cash. Do you want those items to go outside the family or do you want the family to have the first right to bid on and obtain those items before they're sold to unrelated third parties? Those are all issues we can help our clients address in the planning process. And M Marty, I hadn't wanted to interrupt, although I know you've encouraged us to do that, but on the prior slide, there was just one additional point that I had wanted to make about the excluding coins and cash and golden certificates from the disposition. And I know, Sandy, you had touched upon this briefly at the very, very beginning and referenced the Florida statute, but for our clients, that can be very important that rather than just assigning all of the tangible property to the children to be divided. There are some kinds of tangible property that even though they're considered tangible property, they really think of them more as financial assets and probably should. So in a well-drafted uh, dispositive provision, typically we will see that carved out. We won't see it carved out in the assignment, of course, because you want to be uh, making sure all of those assets are also assigned to the trust or the LLC, um, but you will exclude those in the actual uh, disposition to the extent you're not specifying individual um, items. And there are there's sample language of all of this in the addendum. I know we all contributed, uh, contributed something, so there's some, some sample language there as well. And just, Kim, be care just be oh, careful sorry. applying any any standard approach because every time you think you have an approach for tangible property that should be pretty commonly used, the next client that walks in is going to want something different or have some unique twist to it. So just just always be alert for the the one-off situations because they're they're more common than not. And I think Sandy said that earlier. Yep, that's an excellent point. Thank you for reiterating it. And, and don't be shy, the, Kim. Uh, um, both Sandy and Kim have mentioned coins, gold bars, other bullion, uh, perhaps currency. Heritage is the largest coin dealer in the world. So I know nothing personally. My background is entirely in fine art. and But over my years with the company, I have worked with many numismatists on many estates and other projects and that many, many, many people have these collections uh, that often they inherited. They were not collectors. They didn't, they were not the people to collect these coins or this currency. And they simply have no idea. It's been sitting in boxes for 30, 40 years. You always need to ask when you're asking about what kind of tangible personal property do you have? Do you have any coins? And they're probably going to say, no, but I have grandpa's stamp collection. And that's a whole, that's a subject for a whole nother day. But coins are very easy to have, to find out what are appreciable or have uh, potential to be worth more than the face value versus, hey, take these to the bank versus this is worth the value of the melt gold today or the melt of silver today. And that's going to change based on the commodities markets. I had a friend whose mother was a collector. And when I say collector, that's an understatement. When she died, they did a drone that went through the storage building, buildings, multiple buildings of items that she had collected down in Texas. Um, and that was the biggest project she had. And in the time frame to prepare a 706, she found it nearly impossible to get values on all the tangible property that were in all of the buildings um, that she held those collections in. Some things were kept in a way that would preserve their value and others were in barns where, you know, was probably not conducive to keeping the value, but one of the items she had kept separate and apart had been a, a scroll that she thought was very valuable, but no one could really put a value on that item because the provenance of the item had not been maintained. And so all of these issues, when we're dealing with 
even the items that you're talking about, it could be a coin, right? It could be an ancient coin, Roberta. But if you don't have the provenance on some of those things, they become difficult to value. Okay, let's let's go on. Sandy, were you going to comment on redemption and explain it? Sure. Um, redemption is, a, is something I find people don't think a lot about, um, but it's the order in which a bequest will be considered to lapse when there aren't sufficient assets in the estate to pay the obligations of the estate. So the, the, where we put a specific bequest of a tan, piece of tangible personal property can actually be very important. And how we deal with the order of redemption, we can state that in our documents as opposed to relying on state law, which may vary from state to state, as to what will end up happening. And there are a lot of estates that are insolvent, right? They may be in, there, we may have more states that are insolvent when we have a lower federal estate tax exemption and people have to raise money and sell off assets in order to pay the estate taxes. So the, where we place an item in terms of its location within our estate planning documents, how we define the order in which items will deem, what ends up happening if the item is sold or no longer exists at the time items are to be divided, are all things that I think are important to consider as part of the drafting process. So in terms of drafting suggestions, um, Kim, you were going to comment on some specific suggestions, and then Sandy and I can, can chime in. Yeah, and I was just looking at this, and we actually have uh, been so uh, comprehensive that I think we've covered most of these. The excluding the coins, cash, gold, and certificates was the point that I had just been making, and um, inventorying and safeguarding we've talked about, and the method of valuation. Uh, we hit upon just a little bit the, the designing the mechanism for division um, and the process for resolving disputes and whether or how to equalize. But but I think that that's really the crux in drafting of where it gets very complicated very quickly to think about the best way to put that into practice. So Sandy and Marty, I know you both are still drafting. What are your thoughts? I, I like getting the idea of clients periodically updating uh, their inventory and their values. It's not that expensive to do, and it can identify things that have been missing. It can identify changes in the client's wishes. So I think that's that's certainly something uh, to address. In terms of valuation, keep in mind if you have, as I think it was Sandy pointed out earlier, if there's a collection, there may be an inherent value to the collection and a reason to keep the collection uh, together um, and getting an inventory of the collection um, uh, is certainly something that makes sense. And Roberta, if you want to comment on collections when we're, we're, we're done with uh, this, these comments, you, you should feel free to jump in. Um, in terms of dispute resolution, um, be careful that if, if you want to use or the client wants some type of, of mandatory arbitration, that you may need to have people sign off agreeing to that ahead of time uh, or they won't be bound by it. Uh, equalization, we didn't mention, so just worth noting, sometimes insurance can be useful for this. If there's collections you want to keep intact, uh, equalizing errors that aren't getting the collection uh, using insurance may be viable. And insurance is going to take on new meaning for tangibles if we end up with a dramatically lower exemption amount and, and you know, restrictions on, on uh, discounts. And keep in mind in terms of valuation, the Sanders tax proposal, which was recently uh, floated if that's uh, an appropriate word because uh, we don't have any clue what, what we're going to end up with but if we end up with a, a a restriction that you cannot have discounts on non-business assets uh, art is not going to likely be qualified as a business asset there's not going to be discounts 
and a lot of the planning that had been su pursued previously, su uh, such as setting up an LLC and giving away slices, you know, annual gift exclusions are going to could be severely restricted. Discounts could be uh, eliminated for non-business assets. Um, that's going to change a lot of how we handle tangible property. Um, equalization is always an interesting discussion with clients on tangibles and in general. You know, some clients are adamant that every heir get an equal dollar value, which can be very difficult to do uh, with tangibles. Uh, and it, it could also, and this is important in, 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 in addressing how you draft and plan, if, if you're going to have stuff appraised, the child not getting the collection is very likely going to argue the collection is worth more than what the appraisal is because they want to get equalized at a higher rate. So you have to be careful not to pit one error against another with that. When you're looking at life estates, and Sandy pointed out, you know, for example, uh, tangibles go to a Q-tip and, and the surviving spouse wants them income producing, you know, creating a, a right of first refusal. One of the things to keep in mind with any kind of trust ownership of property, uh, tangible property, is, is funding the cost of maintenance, insurance, and so on and so forth. Make sure you have enough non-tangible uh, marketable securities, for example, in the trust to cover the cost of maintaining and doing whatever needs to be done, where you could really find that the, the trustee is in a pickle trying to maintain property that you want uh, maintained. Um, Sandy, do you have any comments? And, and then it, we'll see if uh, uh, Roberta has any comments on collections. Yeah. So, so one of the examples that I like to give is um, where a client had picked certain pieces of art and they wanted to make sure each child got a special piece of art. And they thought in their mind, by doing that, they were providing an equal disposition among their three children. But one piece of art appreciated significantly. One ended up depreciating significantly. And one ended up staying about the same. And at the end, the plan that the client had for each child to receive an equal disposition was thwarted because of the market. The market value of those items at the time of death didn't provide for an equal disposition. So thinking about um, how you're going to address market fluctuations or the fact that um, you gave an item on a list and then at the time of death that item had been given away or disposed of so that that beneficiary doesn't receive that item. Well, if that was a means that the person was using to equalize in their mind what beneficiaries were giving, think about do they get something to make up the fact for the fact that they don't have their, their item was given away, but everybody else got an item on the list. You know, so thinking about those things proactively, I think is important as part of the, planning process and then peer, telling your clients periodically i say to my clients every four years take your estate planning documents out and that includes your list disposition and four years to me is an easy reminder i say because the climate changes in washington with the change of uh in, in election years so it makes it an easy time for them to remember just take it out See if the items, if you still have the items, if your state plan still accomplishes what you're trying to accomplish. I know, Marty, you like to meet with your clients more frequently, but a lot of my clients are not going to come back every year to review their state plan or on a regular basis. It's hard enough to get them to come back when you say if you've got a life change or something significant happens or you dispose of your business or you're getting ready to dispose of a significant, significant item come and see me, they don't always even do that. But if you say to them, each presidential election, take your documents out and look at them and see if they still accomplish what you want them to, they may actually do that. Just, I think just, that's um, probably right. Or the Olympics, Sandy. <laughs> I think the point Sandy made about changes in value with uh, one one piece of art appreciating significantly, one depreciating, one staying the same, it sounds a little bit like the three bears of tangibles, but clients often are not <laughs> aware of what the changes in value are. 
And that's why periodically, whether it's every three years, four years, but periodically clients need to get the, the inventory updated and the values updated because unless the clients are a professional in the industry, they're not going to have any clue. And Roberta gave some examples, uh, and I, I didn't get up because she said something negative about brown furniture, and I'm sitting on a brown chair, so I was ashamed to get up. But, but you know, <laughs> things do change, and clients aren't going to know if they're not professionals. So updating no. that inventory value is really important because they're not going to know if they need to update what they're planning or the dispositions or the, the documents we've drafted are. And, hey, by the way, this is another interesting use of a swap power. It's not only about swapping something back out of a trust to get a basis step up. It might be about rearranging the dispositive provisions by swapping a tangible out of a trust and putting a different tangible in. Right. Well, I think I think Sandy's four year idea uh, for most clients, it, that's a good one in terms of looking at the value of the tangible assets, both for insurance coverage to make sure they will be made whole in the event, especially as more and more clients, as they get older, move to places that have hurricanes and all these other perils. It, it's both the insurance and the fair market value for the estate plan. Marty, you're right. Unless uh, somebody is really following the markets very closely, they probably have no idea what's currently up, down, et cetera. Um, but then there are certain markets that are the ones I think of as the rapid moving markets, super contemporary art, for instance. There is a whole segment of the contemporary art market right now where we have clients who bought something less than two years ago for say $40,000, the, it's a young artist, they're hitting the secondary market immediately, and now it's $200,000. And that's less than two years time. Can't get the work in the primary gallery market anymore. It's already out there changing hands that quickly. Most collecting areas don't move that quickly. An old master market, for instance, is more like kind of like the old blue chip thinking, you know, it stays fairly steady. And if you reviewed it every four years, you'd be fine and there might not be any change. But in, in certain categories, and then there are these new categories, like I mentioned before, the, um, and then categories that people know they have. A lot of our clients know they collected baseball cards as a child and they've kept them throughout their lives. They have no idea. It's a market that it's on fire and, even though they thought, well, I have a Mickey Mantle, I have some good things, I know that, but maybe they never needed any cash, no reason, it's sentimental, it's from their childhood. These markets move all the time. And then to your other point about collections. So not some collections are truly collections, whether it's because they all as a piece are more valuable than the sum of their parts because they are together or they were deliberately collected with a, a, a very clear thought pattern to what was being bought and what and then other things people refer to as collections and often come to me and go well i want to sell it but i need to keep the whole collection together they're not collections they are a collection in the sense that they are a group of objects perhaps with similar thing but they they're they don't change so if the value of the parts is no different whether the items are together or or broken apart then it's a different kind of collection than the kind of collection that does need to stay together because you're devaluing it. A good example that we see a lot of is people bought whole portfolios of prints when they were issued by, you know, very well-known 20th century artists, Dali, Chagall, Picasso, and, and they never, and they kept them all in the original box and dust, cover, et cetera. That portfolio is worth a great deal more all intact with all its parts than had we framed them all up and and maybe gave one to my sister and one to my brother, and, and I no longer have the full 
suite of prints. So you need to ask some questions and perhaps go looking for some advice from somebody like myself as to, is this a collection? Does it really need to be together? Is it more valuable as a whole than in the parts? So one of the one of the key issues, and it's probably obvious, but we didn't state it. So let me state it here on slide 18 with respect to title. If you buy a vacation home, you're going to have a deed. And if you buy it in a rev trust so that you avoid probate, the trust is going to have a deed. There's a deed that makes it very clear who owns that home. But with tangibles, the artwork, the furniture in the vacation home on slide 18, you often don't have uh, uh, anything equivalent to a deed. Maybe you have a bill of sale if the people bought it, but if somebody bought a piece of art 30 years ago, they may not have saved the bill of sale. And 30 years ago, nobody was scanning. You know, nowadays, maybe if people are paperless, there's gonna be a, an electronic copy of something to prove what was purchased. From decades ago, maybe nothing. If something was inherited, there may be nothing unless you can find, and Kim, I think, gave the example of a, a grand, or grandfather's estate tax return. Unless you can find a gift or estate tax return, there may be nothing. So one of the issues that arises with tangibles is you just don't have the paperwork trail. And that's why it's so important to create the trail, figure out who owns it, and make sure it's owned in the right place so that the disposition occurs the way you want and you minimize disputes. One of the common disputes that we've seen in practice is where a second, third, fourth spouse is bequeathed, uh, whether it's bequeathed the home or a life estate in a home or a trust interest in a home, and the tangibles aren't addressed, and the kids sometimes, or heirs, just to be spiteful sometimes, will strip out all the property. All right, so that, 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 that new spouse can get uh, 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 dad's home, but we're gonna pull out all the furniture, all the artwork, all the oriental rugs, everything that made it beautiful is now gone and they have a stripped bare home. So you really need to think it through and try to avoid those types of issues, especially given the, the, the um, uh, lack of clarity that often happens with title for uh, tangibles. Uh, we have found in some instances, and um, like I said earlier, if trusts are subject to a 50-year GST rule, it may even become more common, using an LLC that may own a vacation property that's en then owned by a trust to perhaps have the same LLC or a different LLC own the tangibles in the home so that it's all addressed. And the reason that we will often have an LLC do it is many of the trusts that all of us create are in trust-friendly jurisdictions, which may be different than where the client is domiciled, and having uh, real property outside of that jurisdiction uh, could be problematic, so you have uh, the property in an LLC. The same goes for tangibles. You don't want to have tangible property owned by a trust that's an Alaska trust if that tangible is sitting in a, in a vacation home in upstate New York. It should be in an LLC so that you don't have issues of New York law applying to a, an Alaskan trust. Uh, Kim or, or Sandy, do you want to come Marty, can I add one other thing to that? Of you know, course. there was a recent case and it's a real estate case, but I think it's apropos here to the titling consideration. So there was a recent case that came down, I think it was Minnesota case on insurance where uh, it was a uh, Lady Bird deed. And so upon the death of the grantor, the property immediately vested in the pay upon death beneficiary, basically, uh, the taker in default under the Lady Bird deed. And when a fire occurred, intentionally set by the person's ex-spouse, Within days of the of the grantor's death, insurance was denied because the insurance was in na in the name of the grantor, and at the time of the loss, the property was held by the taker in default. The same kind of issue, I think, applies to tangible personal property. So, making sure that the insurance for the tangible personal property is in place and that you know, so you have to coordinate your titling and the insurance so that in the event that there's an inadvertent loss of that property, you've got the proper insurance and it's over the proper entity that holds title to that tangible personal property is important because insurance companies are in the business of making money. They don't like to pay out. So if under the terms 
of the policy, they don't have to pay for that loss. They won't pay for that loss. So it's incumbent upon us to make sure, and part of the process when we're going through it, is to remind our clients to make sure they have proper insurance in place and that it's titled so that there's coverage for that item. Sandy, can you and define ladybird? A ladybird deed. Might... Yeah, define that for people in case they're not familiar with it. So a ladybird deed is really um, an, an enhanced estate. It's where the grantor retains title and retains the right to change the ultimate disposition. So I, I have a, a vacation home in Harbor Springs, and I name my acre default. And in, um, but I retain the right to mortgage it, convey the property, make another disposition. Marty only gets that property if I take no other action during my lifetime. So that's why I said the taker and default. If I decide rather than leaving my vacation home to Marty, because I know he's got a place out east, Kim is closer in Illinois and she might enjoy Harbor Springs. I decide to do a new deed. I don't have to get Marty's permission to change that um, that deed. I can simply do a new deed and make Kim the taker in default. And then I have a falling out with Kim because she never comes to visit me in Michigan. And so I decide Roberta is my new best friend. And I now do a new deed and I name Roberta as the taker in default. I didn't have to get Kim's permission. Or Marty's permission to change that dispositive provision. Whoever is the last in the so-called chain of title of those deeds will end up taking the property free of any probate proceeding. And in fact, in Michigan, free of the ability of the state to go back for Medicaid reimbursement. So there's a reason why a lot of us do those or name our revocable trust as the taker in default so that when a joint parties die, if one doesn't have capacity, they could still have a provision to deal with that property without having to go through probate on the second spouse's death. Thanks. Yeah, just to Thanks, bolster, bolster that, yeah, a lot of states now have these statutes, the transfer on death statutes that, that Sandy's um, describing in part that allow, uh, allow the designation of the taker in default or the transfer on death beneficiary, but then it can be changed during life, just like a retirement account or a life insurance policy could be. Um, you know, one more point as we think about, you know, so the, let's say that the assets are owned in the revocable trust and then the beneficiaries need to divide them up at death. Um, and the, uh, the comments that were made earlier about how, oh, well, everyone will get along and just do it how it's drafted in the document for the division of tangible property makes a huge difference. A lot of times people will just say, oh, well, everyone will draw straws and whoever, you know, goes first will just, you know, they'll, there's three children, they'll draw straws or flip a coin and figure out who's going first and it'll just go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. But as we made the point in our recent BNA article that came out a couple of weeks ago, that really favors whichever child gets to draw first each time and, and which disadvantages the one who's drawing third each time. So to be very thoughtful about designing a system so that things will be fair is, is incredibly important as well. And by the way, for and, all of and, you listening, hang, hang on one second, for all of you listening to the program, the, the article that Kim mentioned, if you email me, and my email's at the end, Shankman at Shankman Law, I'll send you a, a copy of the article. It was written by uh, Kim, Sandy, and I on planning for tangibles. Sandy? And Yes, Marty, I was going to add, you, you mentioned arbitration as a means of resolving this division. And a lot of states don't permit you to have mandatory arbitration. But you can leave the authority for the division of the tangible personal property in the event the beneficiaries cannot agree in the hands of an individual or a fiduciary to buy the tangible personal property as they deem appropriate. So there are a lot of different mechanisms that you can put into place to address this issue um, in anticipation that the family that got along so well while mom and dad were alive may not get along so well once the glue that held the family together is gone. 
And just to build on that. the arbitration comment, Sandy, I'm not a huge fan of arbitration clauses to begin with, even where they are permitted, but I love seeing um, provisions that encourage or, or request or even require mediation before bringing a lawsuit. Getting families through the mediation process before they start suing each other is always a great idea, I think. Agreed. So, Roberta, why don't you educate all of us on working with an auction house? So I think obviously everybody knows auction houses sell things, right? And I think that's pretty self-evident, but what many people don't seem to know is we can be a tremendous resource to uh, planners, fiduciaries, um, advisors, wealth advisors. We do it all day long. Um, most large auction houses, certainly at Heritage, we have an appraisal services division that is, in, in fact, a separate company for uh, to do our best to keep a Chinese wall between our valuation services and our auction auction house aspect, the usual selling venue for things. So with the appraisal services, you you all may know that you want what's called a use path uniform standards of professional appraisal practice this is a, a a kind of ethical standard and kind of requirements if you will what must be in that appraisal a proper description of the item a obviously the value of a photograph uh dimensions etc there's a list of what is absolutely compulsory that you should be looking for. Um, it, when using a document, a re appraisal report that may go to the IRS, absolutely, it should be a USPAP compliant appraisal report. This is slightly different than what Marty is talking about, about an inventory with current values. It, it doesn't need, an inventory with current values can be just that, it's something that, does not need to cost a fortune and can be updated quickly, especially now, you know, we put them in a database and you call and we go through and we look and we see and we can update values. It doesn't need 30 pages of cover documents explaining, you know, what the conditions were in the house and things that are required for an IRS one. But a, another way to use an auction house is for simply pick up the phone or shoot an email. We are on top of the trends in all these collecting categories because that's what we do. So I I had my own appraisal company for oh, almost 20 years before joining Heritage a number of years ago. And one of the big attractions for me was that, oh my gosh, won't it be great to have somebody who knows uh, ethnographic art, somebody who knows sports memorabilia, somebody who knows about American or Americana and political history and documents that have to return my calls because I spent years chasing individual specialists. No appraiser knows about everything. If they tell you you do, they do, I would run. There are so many categories of tangible property that is collectible that you need to be able to access the information. So it, it's an easy thing. We don't charge for that. You can email me. I'm sure Marty will provide you with my email address at the end. All day long, people call, people email and say, hey, what's the market like for Babe Ruth baseballs right now? Sign Babe Ruth baseballs or, or fine art, of course. And that's the other thing is auction houses can also help us in a consulting manner We've talked a lot about provenance today, which is very important. We recently had a wonderful collection from an estate and there wasn't a second wife, but there was a girlfriend. And when the will was read and she found out she wasn't getting anything, she took the entire file that the gentleman had on the provenance and paperwork for his art collection and she shredded it all. And he was an older gentleman. There was no scanned copy in the cloud. And that was a huge mistake. And I hate to tell you, he was an attorney. Um, maybe not an estate planner, but he was an attorney. So 
the provenance is the history of the item, where it came from, when even as simple as it was purchased by my grandmother in 1955 at Marshall Fields. That, that's a provenance. And then other provenances are pages and pages and pages long with exhibition and all this literature. But we haven't talked about authenticity and authentication. And this can be a very big quagmire. It's a complicated thing, especially in the fine art world. And it can change. The person who has the authority to be, to say this is an authentic work by X artist, pick an artist. Um, it changes. And if the documentation isn't right, or it's very old, just like a diamond that was certified by the GIA in 1979, we won't sell that diamond today. Nobody wants that diamond unless it goes back to the GIA for recertification. This can be the same with artwork. Auction houses have people in all these categories and can help you with all of these things. We once had a very unfortunate trust. Artwork had been transferred into the trust the deceased collection. And then at some point down the road, I got a call about, we need to sell some artwork and liquidate. We need some cash. Grandchildren wanna go to college, whatever the reason for the cash was. Every single painting turned out to not be authentic. So they had cared for them. They had put them in art storage. They had been good stewards, but they took the word of the client at the time, well, of course, of course they're real. It, we don't expect all of you as advisors and attorneys to know that, but we can walk you through the process and tell you whether it would need to be done. So use us, we're, we're all here. We rarely charge for these types of services and it could save you a lot of trouble. And then obviously we also, we sell things. We love to sell things. I've been an auctioneer since I was grandfathered in in Illinois regular auction sales sometimes we will tell you a private treaty option would be better for an individual item if an item has a very limited market sometimes it a public auction is not the right way to go we could advise about that most 99 percent of the time a public competitive auction brings the best return and exposes the property for your decedent or your client to the market and then we've also seen a lot in the last few years because I've given a series of lectures entitled, Help My Children Don't Want My Stuff. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason, right? Because I hear it many times a day. I meet with lovely, lovely people who are trying to make a plan and their attorney said, we'll talk to your kids. And the kids are like, we don't want any of it. Help, what are we, what are we gonna do? Many families have charitable and philanthropic goals, either individually or as a couple or as a family that they want to work on. And there are many ways to use tangible personal property to fund your philanthropic goals. And auction houses can assist with that as well. So we're really a bigger resource than just pick up the phone because I have a bunch of stuff that needs to get auctioned off right now. So I welcome anybody to use us for all those resources. If we can't help, we'll find you somebody who can help. I'd like to add something to what you said, Roberta. For those family members, those families whose kids don't want those items, and they know that they don't want those items, including a provision in the estate planning document that indicates that those items are to be sold may permit the estate to take the cost of the auction house sale, right, as opposed to the gross value and include the net value as part of the value of the estate. So having that discussion on the front end and then planning for it to be sold as opposed to disposed of under the tangible personal property uh, general disposition or as part of the residue, but a specific indication that it's supposed to be sold uh, may be an important aspect of the plan. That's right. And also, we, we often get calls through our trust and estate desk where uh, the plan specified 
which auction house to use. Um, a lot of collectors feel very strongly about that. Um, in the coin world, it is not at all unusual to see, you know, the, if the collections to be sold upon my death, contact Heritage Auctions. And then you'll also find that I, all the time, I, we can very quickly pull up what their basis was because they may have bought most of it from us in the first place over the decades and that's the other way you know you can kind of specify what you wanted you want it sold you want the uh, the proceeds divided deduct the expenses are not you know as as sandy just said and we may be able to help with where where it all came from and how much was paid for it in the first place I just want to amplify one of the points that Roberta made because it's not said often enough and it's so vital. Um, clients often do not discuss what they're bequeathing in terms of tangibles with the heirs, the children, for example, and they really should because what Roberta said frequently, and we've all seen this, you know, when handling estate administration, nobody wants the stuff that the parents were bequeathing. And it would be a lot easier to know that upfront. And that, that's a great conversation to have with the client. Have you spoken to the intended heirs? Have you talked to them to see if they even want what you're bequeathing? So good, good Marty, point. The other thing is a lot of people leave their art collections to a museum without ever having the discussion. I get museum calls with some frequency and basically it's, don't even cross the threshold. We do not want any of this. There was no conversation. Sell it and send us a check. You can't. You need to ask your client, I'm leaving it to the Metropolitan Museum or the Art Institute. Have you spoken with them? If they have not, you have to make them reach out because 99%, the answer is going to be no. And along those lines, too, many clients believe that if they donate uh, their collections to a museum, that this stuff is going to be displayed. And when you walk in the museum, there is going to be their stuff. And a lot of times, even if the museum accepts it, it ends up in warehouses, maybe displayed on rare occasion when they have a specific exhibit, if at all. So it's certainly worth the conversations. Um, we're actually uh, at the end of our time, even a little beyond. So. What I think we should do uh, to wrap up, I'm gonna ask uh, each of Sandy, then Kim, then uh, Roberta to make any sort of summary or concluding remarks and we'll close our discussion. I, I do hope that all these comments were interesting for all of you. I found it fascinating. I always learn when uh, uh, speaking with Sandy and, and Roberta and Kim. So I, I thought it was very, very good. Obviously we didn't get through all the materials, which I think is fine. I, I wanted us to, you know, go more naturally through whatever we had. So hopefully it was of, of value for all of you. Um, so Sandy, and there's sample clauses, as we mentioned at the end, thank you to Interactive and thank you to Sandy uh, for some of the sample language. And hopefully that'll help all of you in the bios for everybody's at the end. Um, Sandy, do you wanna make um, some, some last comments? I think we covered a lot. We may not have, we've covered a lot of what was in the slides we just, didn't cover it in the order that the slides appeared. Um, I, I do commend our article for BNA because it does cover the, a lot of the material and the issues that we weren't able to cover today. Um, I do think this, this is an often overlooked area of estate planning, and I hope that we've at least uh, alerted you to some of the issues that you may want to raise with your clients and think about as part of your practice um, that maybe you weren't giving as much much consideration to before and now uh, you know that it can be really helpful to your clients and important to discuss. Kim, any final remarks, comments, thoughts? 
Yeah, just to, to touch upon a couple things, I'm not sure how fully we got into them in the article, um, but certainly if you are working with clients who have very valuable items, you know, you'll want to be alert to the fact that the IRS does have an advisory panel that reviews specific items that are, are worth more than $50,000. And so additional uh, steps need to be taken for what you're submitting and, and taking photographs that, that fit the qualifications and being prepared for that process, either with charitable donations or with gifts. Um, and then we also do have a slide that, that Marty just went through about some advanced planning considerations for clients who, uh, these oftentimes are clients that were worried about advanced planning for art are the ones who really want to use their $11.7 million exemptions that may be disappearing and simply don't have other great assets that they can transfer at this time. If they had investment assets, it might be really easy to just transfer the investment assets to a dynasty trust and then uh, do a swap later uh, for a promissory note and pull those back. But with art, because of the art advice, advisory panel and, and because of, um, you know, just all of the complications with getting qualified appraisals and all of the steps for clients who are trying to make a gift in a hurry, um, transferring art might not be the, the right asset for them to do that. So we do have some ideas that we mentioned about, um, you know, one option is to borrow money from a borrow money from a bank uh, in order to using the art as collateral and then make a gift of the cash. Um, other options may even be some of these uh, hot topics that were being discussed last year about um, making a transfer of a promissory note um, that is secured by the art and then is paid down over time. So just wanted to at least uh, bring people's attention to the, those points before we conclude. But this has been a really fun discussion and there's so much more that we could be talking about, but, uh, but glad that we had an opportunity to at least scratch the surface today. R Roberta? I, I, I totally agree with Kim. This was, this was a, a great conversation and Yes, there's always so much more and collateralization um, with fine art is something I've done a great deal with for lines of credit, all kinds of things. So that is another, uh, a whole nother mechanism, but it all comes down to appraisals and valuations that are done appropriate. But if nothing else, I certainly hope that anybody who hasn't really interacted with an auction house other than maybe consigning something to sell or sending stuff away to be sold. I hope that your takeaway is that we can do an awful lot more for you and can be used as a great kind of sounding board um, and, and as a consultancy and advisory within a broad range of tangible collectible property. Keep in mind, all the tax rules may change. Um, you know, one of the things on the table is that capital gains rates for uh, gains over a million dollars are gonna be taxed at ordinary income rates, which could be 39.6%. So a client looking to liquidate something should be calling Roberta today because the capital gains rates uh, could be next year, could be sooner, we don't know, because everything's so uncertain, could be double what they are now. Um, the estate tax changes, if clients have valuable collectibles and they haven't used their exemption, it certainly seems to make sense to do so now using, if you don't, have other assets, the collectibles, or maybe even intentionally using the collectibles. Clients really need to sit down with their entire team, which would be the attorney, the accountant, the wealth advisor, uh, and in the case of collectibles, somebody like Roberta that has knowledge on it and plan what they need to do because those planning windows could be closing really quick. And keep in mind the, the Sanders tax proposal, which was just floated last week, um, that proposal. Uh, has the effective date of a number of the very harsh provisions, the date of enactment. So that could be, uh, you know, it could be a month from now, it could be never, we don't know. So I think it's it's very important for all of us to circle back to our clients and, and impress upon them the importance of addressing some of the planning for tangible issues now. And a lot of the things that we've spent most of our time talking about, I think apply to clients of all wealth levels, uh, because of the emotional and other aspects of, of planning for uh, tangibles and hopefully we've given you a lot of practical ideas and as we've mentioned there's uh, great resources in terms of sample language and some additional tax and other materials in the resources we've given you. If you would like the article that uh, we've mentioned a couple of times that uh, 
Kim, Sandy, and I wrote, email me, Shankman, S-H-E-N-K-M-A-N, Shankman at shankmanlaw.com, and I'll be glad to uh, email that article to you. I want to thank uh, my great speaker, co-speakers, you were wonderful, uh, Sandy Glazer, uh, Kim Kamen, and Roberta. Um, I greatly appreciate all of your involvements, and I want to thank, uh, um, I'm sorry, Roberta Kramer from Heritage. I want to thank all of you for participating. I want to thank our sponsors, Peak uh, uh, Trust and Interactive Legal, and Wild Cornell, our, our charity uh, for the program. So thank you, everyone, and good luck. Take care.